All right, so if you're just joining us, we're going to talk about optimizing your investments and retirement income. So you'll see the very familiar to you folks, the buckets here. So I'm putting my tablet down so I can draw on it. So you may see me looking down. Um, and if you're just joining us on YouTube, because we do separate these, uh, this is our financial planning topic of optimizing your investments and retirement income. Um, I urge you to um, hit the subscribe, like, and notification buttons so that you'll always get um, updates on when we have new videos. Uh, so we're going to talk about where and how your uh, investments should be uh, positioned to make sure you're optimizing that income. Because isn't it really about this income? You know, we get so caught up when I'm when I'm reading financial articles throughout the weeks, a very common statement is how much should you have in your accounts at what age? You know, at 40, it should be this, at 50, it should be this, at 60, it should be this, at 70, you know, what, 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 whatever it is. Um, the answer is, does it really matter? Well, of course, in some degree it does, but the amount of money in the uh, buckets when you're talking about income, um, doesn't really matter, does it? It's the income that is generated from it. So if you need $100,000 a year in income, and you have to adjust for inflation and all that, and you've got to plan on that, and, you know, let's just say 35 years, you need $100,000 a year well, if you're meeting your objectives, if you're if you're getting your hundred thousand dollars a year, if it's just in for inflation, if it's if if it's doing all the things you need to do, if it's a combination of Social Security, maybe you have a pension, rental income, and in your investments, does it really matter where it's coming from? So, other than just maybe some people have a goal in mind. I want three million dollars. I want five million dollars. Most people aren't concerned about the dollar amount that's in any of their buckets or their total investments, they're concerned about this income. And if they're not, they should be. Because if you can derive $100,000 from a million dollars, then do you really need to strive for more, take additional risk, et cetera? Now that's a big number, right? You'd have to have a lot of other income coming in. I'm just using it as an example. But I just want to kind of, I'd love for the, the conversation to get away from how much money do you need to how much income do you need? And that's, that's a fundamental kind of uh, question. And, and frankly, the financial advisory world doesn't really like that conversation because they don't charge fees or we don't charge fees based on income. We charge fees based on assets. So it's not in the big firms benefit, I'm kind of getting on my soapbox here to say, hey, you really don't need $5 million, you need $3 million. Uh, you only need 3 million, five would be nice, but you really, let's just shoot for three because that's gonna get your get your needs met. They Well, if they're charging 1% on your $3 million, they wanna get it to five, right? Uh, that's how they continue to make money. So um, of course it's our investments and our, other income sources that drive this retirement income. So we do have to optimize where these investments sit. So let me just uh, get that off of here. Why isn't that erasing? Goodness. Okay. So I hope that first part makes sense. But why do we do this? So we're going to talk about how things should be should be positioned in here. But why? Um, why do we do this? So there are a couple of risks that we want to cover. Um, first of all, we always talk about market risks. These are the kind of the four that you that everybody, you know, first of all, it covers almost everything. And um, you really want to pay attention to. And I often will list these and I ask clients to um, uh, list them in order. And they're just one, two, three, four here because that's how many there are. Uh, everybody's got a different uh, different order. Your, your market risk might be four. Uh, your tax rate risk might be one, longevity risk, and I'll go through what these mean, but you might, you might list these or um, 
uh, as, as far as importance differently. So don't pay attention to that. But of course, market risk is what we've been experiencing throughout the year. We started at a certain amount of money and because of things outside of our control, right? The general markets, we have less, right? So, uh, we, you know, our, our $3 million is now worth $2.5 million or $2 million, depending on how you're invested and what your experience has been. So that's market risk. Um, how long, you know, or how are my investments going to respond to um, outside influences and things beyond my control? And we have longevity risk. Well, longevity risk is if I'm going to be here till 90, I can't have my money stop at age 85 or age 89, right? Right. So I can't have that income stop. Again, it's not about, well, I still have my $3 million. It's, well, I still have that $100,000 that I need um, uh, adjusted for the inflation amount that I need. Because your inflation amount, you know, just like your withdrawal amount, those different things that we talked about are, are you know, might be different than others. You might have, you might have areas that you spend differently. You know, you got your, you have your core inflation, but you might have your own kind of personal inflation number because you do things differently. And it might be higher or lower, but you don't want the money to run out, right? So while you're still here, and you can joke about this sometimes, but it, it it's really serious. If you live to be 90, if you live to be 95, and that's when we project our average longevity is 95. I know that's well beyond what, what the, the tables and the government tells us, but that's what we feel comfortable with in our financial plans. But you want to make sure that your money's still going to be there at age 95. And then you have long-term care risk. So long-term care, of course, you've heard about, you've heard me talk about it. We had, you know, um, uh, guests, uh, specialists on, on, on these webinars, but um, long-term care costs are enormous. They can draw down a portfolio very, very quickly. They put a lot of pressure on your, on your heirs, or, or if, you're, if you're a single person with no kids, it's even more important to have plenty of funds put aside um, because you're going to rely on others um, to take care of you. So that is, if you need a medical, uh, if, if you need um, long-term medical care in the future, you have that long-term care risk. And then, of course, tax rate risk. We talk about tax rate risk a lot. We believe that taxes are going to be essentially doubled by 2030 uh, for most of middle, uh, middle class American, for sure. Um, but uh, we have to cover that tax rate risk. So your order might be different, but these are the whys, right? We want to cover these risks. So we have to optimize your, your, your accounts, your investments, not only to make sure that we're taking the, the uh, distributions from the right places, but we're also managing the risks around all of these. And we talk in many different ways about how we do that, but we're going to just go over the buckets today because we want to op, uh, optimize for, of course, cash flow and any estate planning that you have. So we know then you've got your three buckets. So we know the taxable bucket, right? The, anything you get in the annual 1099, that's not, um, that's not retirement related. And the, you see these for interest, dividends, um, capital gains, and these can be long-term gains or short-term gains. And we talked about those a lot. Um, and we're seeing those now. We have mutual funds that are significantly down for the year, but are, are, are uh, sending out embedded gains. That's, that's one of these just kind of putting salt in the wounds. Geez, my fund is down. I'm getting these embedded capital gains. And, and I, you know, but I've lost money throughout the years, throughout the year. And that stinks. Um, but we're, we're definitely seeing those. So sometimes capital gains are controllable, sometimes they're not, but interest, dividends, capital gains, we get that every year. And so we know that we want six months to one year of expenses in these buckets, or excuse me, in this taxable bucket, because if you have more than that, you risk having money pushed out. That is, that creates a 1099s on this interest dividends and capital gains that is going to cause this amount of tax that's unnecessary, right? It's because your social security to be taxed if it's not already or, or taxed at a higher tax rate. It's just something that is often not controllable. Um, and unless there's some estate planning to, to do in this area with um, passing um high valued positions, you know, um, with a stepped up in basis, then you want to keep this to a six months to one year of expenses. 
In tax deferred, we know that for some people, you can keep a, uh, an amount that creates a required minimum distribution that is um, less than your standard deduction. And if you can do that, then your RMD can be uh, tax-free. Now, that gets complicated. I'm not going to get into that right now. But for some people, that's as much as, you know, I've seen $250,000. You know, sometimes it's $100,000 and often it's $0, but it all depends on your situation. And then, of course, we say that everything else, right, should be in this tax-free or tax-advantaged bucket. And there are only two things that are truly tax-free, and that's your anything Roth, Roth 401k, Roth 403b. Roth IRA, we talked about Roth conversions. They are um, a process, not an investment, but anything Roth and some cash value of life insurance. So there are ways, of course, to move money from here. And we're doing tons of it now from tax deferred to tax free. And we use Roth conversions to do that. And that's a very precise calculation that we do every year for our clients. And if you're doing it yourself, you should be very, very careful of how you do it because you don't want to trigger certain things that you're not aware of or you're not planning for. But you do want to make sure you fill up as much as you can that optimum tax bracket, which for most people is 24%. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to go up above that. Sometimes it makes sense to be down below it. There is no one formula for everybody. Uh, it all depends on your situation. So you'll see here, you know, these dollar amounts. And this is just a symbol here. So really, this, this should be reduced a little bit. Let's take this down to a two. Also, let's take this down to a one. Because you kind of want to think about, you know, pouring what you need out of these buckets. Because if, let's go back to that $3 million number. So if you had... Uh, $2,750,000 in this bucket. And you had, uh, let's use 250,000. Now let's use less. Let's use $100,000 here. And let's say you could keep $100,000 in your, in your traditional IRA and your $100,000 um, would produce a required minimum distribution uh, that is about uh, $3,000, right? Uh, maybe a little bit more. Let's call it $4,000 in the first year. Close, very close to that. So that is well below even an individual standard deduction. So that leaves some, some flexibility. So then you, absent any other income, you wouldn't pay any tax on that required minimum distribution. And absent any other income, it wouldn't cause your social security to be taxed. Um, and then let's say you have the remaining amount, 150,000 over here. So that leaves a little over one year of expenses for you. So that's a little bit more, you know, we're back on this $100,000 a year. That may or may not be your number, but let's just use it as an example. So again, whether it's $5 million or $3 million, or if you could do it with $2 million, you could produce $100,000 and it's funneling from the right places and you're minimizing your tax liability, does it really matter what the large number is? I don't want to say you shouldn't, you know, if you, if you have $5 million, give it away. I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm trying to ease, ease the, uh, the pressure of either getting back there or getting to there, because this should be our focus. How do we get here? What's our need? Of course, if you have goals to pass it to your heirs, that's really commendable and it's a great thing. And it's nice to be able to do. I hope I can do that for my kids one day. But most people, the large majority of people come to us and then we ask them about their estate plan and they say, whatever's left, I want to make sure whatever's left passes to my kids as much as possible. But I want to make sure that our needs are taken care of. And what are your needs? Your, your, your needs in this example are $100,000. So if we're, if we're smart in our planning and we look at it every year and we make adjustments along the way, and we optimize where our money sits every year. We make adjustments here. You might look at this um, 
in a year and say, hey, you know what, $50,000, that's that's too much sitting here. We've got to have a plan for drawing that down. This $100,000 might be great for a married couple, but it needs to be shrunken down when one cup, when one spouse passes. I say when I was at when I was at this presentation in, in Gainesville, there is um, an advisor giving a presentation. He was talking about the difference between um, uh, the married rates and the uh, single tax rates. And he said, and he kept saying, if well, if, if one of your spouses or if one of your, if, if, if your husband or wife dies, this is what happens. If, and I raised my hand and I said, why do you say if? And he said, well, what do you mean? We all die. So we have to prepare clients for the fact that it's going to happen. Very, very rarely do husbands, you know, spouses pass at the same time when they're over 60, 65. You know, the statistics get much, much uh, broader. When you're younger, th your statistics are that you're more likely to pass together. But obviously, as you get older, it changes. So very, very rarely. I mean, sometimes, you know, um, men sometimes go soon after wives pass, but it's not at, often at the same time. So uh, we're going to pass. And uh, you've got to plan for that. So even for uh, a married couple, uh, 100,000 might be the right, right amount, but uh, you know, it may make sense. And I always tend to plan right, with the idea that it's going to be a single filer at some point. And I don't want my single filer to have too much money in that IRA. I'd rather do that conversion, get it moved over um, so that we are looking at tax advantaged or tax-free assets. Because if we can eliminate these or, or minimize or, or adjust these risks every year, we have to look at things that are, uh, that are out of our control and try to take it in our control as much as possible. So we can handle market risk by um, you know, rebalancing our assets, using principal protection, using account segmentation. We do have answers to these things, but the markets are out of our control. Our decisions for our investments are not. Longevity risk, well, we can handle those things as well, right? Proper planning, making sure we're invested the right way and making sure our assets are in the right buckets because if suddenly the, the amount of tax that you're paying here is zero and you've prepaid all your tax out of here, well, you're gonna need less money from your Roth IRAs, aren't you, than from your traditional IRAs? You know, I had a conversation with somebody and they said, wow, that amount that come, that's coming out of the, the traditional IRA to, to do the conversion to pay the tax seems much higher than 24%. Well, it is in total because you you're paying tax not on the $200,000 that you convert, right, as an example, but the $300,000, this is just an example, that you're distributing to either pay for cost of something else that you need, the tax uh, on a distribution. So this might be 24% uh, on $300,000, but it's a, it's, it's a much greater percentage on the 200,000. I hope that makes sense. And so that not only has uh, an effect during conversion, but of course it has an effect during um, distribution because the big question is, of course, what, what's going to happen? What's the future of tax rates? And uh, nobody wants to pay uh, tax at the I don't know tax rate because we, we're certain that's going to be higher. So when we talk about optimizing your uh, investments for uh, uh, retirement income, it is simply having your funds in the right buckets so that regardless of the amount of money you're getting the income that you need. So going back to this number as an example, and you shouldn't really care where it comes from um, as far as the dollar amount. You should care where it comes from here because that's going to maximize your, your drawdown. That's going to maximize your funds. That's going to maximize um, the uh, longevity risk for sure. Not, not uh, maximize the risk, but, but help handle that longevity risk because we've seen just by, and I, I've, I've shown on these webinars through a financial planning process, you know, we take, we take a sample client who's at a deficit and just by changing their uh, investment structure, we, um, we gain them X number of years. And then by doing Roth conversions, we 
gain them another X number of years. And often it's seven to 10 years. So that really helps manage that longevity risk. Long-term care risk has to be managed a, whole, a completely different way, but you know um, uh, that of course can just destroy uh, you know years and years of planning, savings, all that. So it has to be addressed. And of course, uh, tax rate risk. So uh, it's very uh, important, vitally important to know exactly where these funds should be in your buckets and uh, how they're drawing out of these buckets and what that tax rate is going to be. Because you got to hit this goal. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be five, 10 years in your retirement and say, oh, well, I can only take uh, or I still have to take $100,000 a year. And now my 100,000 is really only buying me, you know, $80,000 worth of goods, services, gas, food, breads. Um, we don't we don't want that. We want to have this continue to grow for you. And there are ways to do it. Um, and you can see, I hope, that uh, optimizing where your money sits is very, very important. And I have to say, because we're in... Roth conversion time and people are dealing with things like paying taxes and, you know, they're looking at their Irma's uh, and, and all that. You've got to just stay the course. And it's important to have these conversations year over year, over and over again, um, just to keep on top, see the value because it is, um, you know, we, when, when uh, often when I'm first talking to people about the benefit of Roth conversions, we talk in dollars. Well, we do this a little bit differently um, just, just making changes to how you're paying your tax and where you're positioning your, your investments. It'll, you, it'll be $2 million more at um, age 85 or $3 million more at age 85. But as I said, as we started this, it's really not about that, is it? It's about addressing these risks, the four risks that I went through for sure. Because that's that sleep at night, making sure you're all set up. And folks, you, you have to sleep at night. You have to sleep well at night because of your own issues, right? And your own concerns and your own plan. Well, I've got to do that for all of you, right? So I want to make sure I'm sleeping well at night too, because the, the things that really uh, wake me up in the middle of the night is a failed plan. So I had to make sure that you're all in good shape as well. Um, the, um, and I lost my train of thought there, but, it, but it, uh, uh, it's, really, it's really about where the income comes from. Uh, unless your goal is to leave a, a sizable or a certain estate to your to your uh, heirs, uh, that's something that's important too. So we should pay attention to that. But that can also be a separate issue, because even if that's the case, oh, and that's where I was getting to was I often talk about the dollar amount, but it really has to be about um, you know the the income goal. Uh, if your goal was a state, well, that's kind of simple, right? So let's go back to that $5 million number. When this goes back to account segmentation, you've all seen this before. You know, we've got your time, zero to three years, uh, four to six years, uh, seven to nine years, and so on. Um, you know, the um, what, what we usually end up with is this leg legacy longevity column. And that just means this is money that you're not going to need during your lifetime. If, if you need it, it's there. If you don't, uh, you pass to your heirs. Well, out of that $5 million, for example, there might be $2 million sitting here. Well, that goes back to the same fundamental issue. Well, now we have $3 million here and we need to do what? We need to create income for your retirement. So over the next 35 years or 30 years, whatever your lifespan is going to be, uh, it's not just a wish list. We hope this goes well, you know, from the time you retire till the time you're no longer here, we've got to develop a plan for each segment, you know, in each portfolio, you've seen me do this a million times, each portfolio or a portfolio for each segment of, of your life. And then you, you um, can vary it down, but it's the same thing. You just need to identify. So even if, and, and sometimes that'll help ease your um, concerns too, is, I feel like I have this $5 million number. I read it in Forbes that I should have, you know, $3 million by the time I'm 65, whatever. Um, that's not your number, first of all, and it doesn't matter. What matters is the amount that you can, um, that you can live off of, off of that. And if that fits your needs, goals, and issues. Um, so I hope that all makes sense. I'm way over. It's 1059. I hope that was beneficial. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in the new year. 
on the new format in the new studio. If you need something immediately, if you're a client, uh, please reach out. Um, if, uh, if you're not, we're happy to hear from you as well. But um, I wish you all a great um, rest of December. I wish you all a great rest of 2022. Looking forward to seeing you all in the new year. And so I wish you a happy new year, but I'll see you in early January. Have a great day. Have a great week and have a great rest of the, rest of the year. Take care.